fit to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive Inc. Now, let's go Under the Hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood show from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood show. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Thanks for joining us Under the Hood. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to answer your calls at 866-594-4150. 866-594-4150. What's caught your attention in the automotive world? I just saw something this morning. I think it came out yesterday. Uh, the new, they unveiled the Cadillac Lyric. Uh, they had it out as a concept car. It's very close to the the 23 version it they it's the 2023 and they said that this will be this is the moment from now on they will not ever introduce a new internal combustion engine from this moment on every car they new car new vehicle they put out will be electric new model right so yeah folks uh, don't go call us in a year and say well oh, there's another XTS, you know. Yeah, they said in their oldest, right now, the oldest vehicle in their fleet is the 4, the XT4. Is there an XT4? Yeah. And it's only like 2018 or, and otherwise they're all new. They have been coming out with a lot of new models and I'm frankly just floored when I look at some of these cars and I just driving down the road the other day and I look over, what is that? You know, Hyundais with new names on them, Nissans with new names on them. Like, what? Things you've never heard of. They've just came out, but they got so little press in 2020 compared to other sure. ones coming out. And I'd, maybe if you want to look at car models, you better just drive to the dealership and see what's on the on the floor as far as brand new cars go. So they're saying, in a sense, then that we've gotten this gas motor about as far as we're going to take it at their so, company. Yeah. This is this is all she wrote. I assume that they'll keep like the they've talked about the hybrids coming. I assume that they'll keep the the current models. They'll they'll keep some sort of a it, what they'll do. What they'll do. My my research. Well, I'm not going to say research. Just what I've been paying attention. I'm sure they'll will take the platforms that they have and they will continue to maximize them with technology that's probably in the tank waiting. Right. And if we could get a higher octane fuel supply there's adjustments that they could make if they had the if the entire fleet of fuel supply was at a higher octane rating there's changes that they could make to those gasoline engines i know there's other companies that have made announcements it's it's really going to be interesting to see how this plays out because this this overlap period between what appears to be a movement towards the electrics and the amount of worldwide usage of the ICE engine Mm -hmm. in that transition, what's going to happen? Because I know, you know, BMW came out and they made an announcement that said, you know, we're, no, we're still making gas engine cars. We're, 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 you know, we'll, we'll keep working on hybrid and electric, but we're still making gas cars. And as the price of fuel is going back up again, there's some in the industry that are looking and saying, um, what do you think? Did Ford make the right decision and stop making cars or was Honda right where they just kept making their sedans and now they're still sitting there with all their models waiting for $4 fuel? Uh, and with- it's going to be interesting. It's going to be very interesting. This, this overlap period and transition period is going to be, I think, quite interesting and insane. And with all due respect to any automaker or anybody who issues a press release, announcements can change. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can you can come out with a new announcement whenever you want that will modify your previous announcements. We've I, seen that. So I was listening to a, a a political one the other day, not not the actual announcement, but the the terms of it. Just like you're saying, Chris, they said, "So this is the announcement we're making today, and it's it expires on this date." So it's like saying, "Okay, we are going to uh, call the sky blue." Um, next month, but if 
that doesn't happen, then this announcement expires at the end of next month. So don't go back and <laughs> and try to Hold say us to it. You you said that yeah. exactly. It was strangest thing I'd ever heard. Eight six six five nine four four one five zero. Let's talk to Brittany. You're on the end of the hood show, Brittany. What can we do for you? Hi. Yeah. Um. I just got a 2017 Ford Expedition, and I was wanting to use E30 because I've heard such good things about it. But I see on the manufacturer they don't recommend anything higher than an E15. Can you tell me what would happen with my engine if I use that E30? Well, and, and here's the thing, and that's 2017 Expedition. First, which engine do you have in the vehicle? Oh, uh, do you know what engine we have? Is it an EcoBoost or is it a yeah. straight? Is it uh, a turbo? I think it's an EcoBoost. Okay, because if it's a yes, turbo the EcoBoost. Uh, d- and does it say in your owner's manual that it recommends premium fuel? Or does it say 87, 89 octane? Do you know? Because that's that's nope. where we need nope. to. Nope. It, it, yep. It says that it it's not the E87 equivalent. No, no, no. That's Russ's question is different than that. Let's right. yeah, take another shot at so, it. Okay. With all vehicles, you need to look in your owner's manual. That's where it will tell you what kind of fuel it recommends. And if it says fuel recommended, 87 octane or 89 octane or above that's yeah well that's the recommended fuel but if it says required it means it requires it so some cars are required to use a premium some cars are okay. required are, so it says just require. recommended okay so it says recommended premium yes okay so if it's recommended premium fuel um so my the camaro i drive it recommends premium fuel. Premium fuel is going to be 91 octane and above. I run E30 in that. Now, it's not certified for that car. They didn't go through all the process of, of doing that. You definitely can't run it on anything above E30. I wouldn't do that in my own okay. car. It it's, it's just won't work for it. And it doesn't work on every car. Um, so, really, if you're going to use that, it's a choice you have to make for yourself. We use it in ours, but it's definitely not certified for that. But it's for me, it's met my octane requirements for the car. And as far as a premium goes, and it's not so much ethanol content that it's going to cause it to run lean. But and, and her, her, her question though, was what's going to happen to the vehicle if she uses that fuel? And I guess you were just getting to that at the end of your, your comment there. If you get too much alcohol content in a vehicle that's not designed for the flex fuel capabilities to adjust for that, it can be damaging. Yeah, so you don't you don't want to go okay. over. I mean, E15 is going to be the certified fuel for that vehicle that it can be that can be used in it. Yep. I would not be surprised if during the from from the talk we've heard that during the next year, this 12 month period, we're going to hear more talk of 20s and 30s being pushed to be allowed in vehicles. Now, it, it won't go any higher than that because you just can't physically use that in most engines unless it's a flex fuel car. But I I would not be surprised because there's other countries that are doing it, so I would not be surprised to see 20s and 30s in, in a lot of these cars come out. The E30 will give you that octane appetite satisfaction that your engine is looking for. But that extra okay. alcohol content in certain vehicles will cause it to trigger check engine lights because it's mm-hmm. running wrong and they can't map. The computer mapping doesn't stretch far enough to adjust for that. Now, that new of a vehicle, Russ, would I, I mean, I don't want to say things that I shouldn't because I don't want people running out and just doing this without thinking about it. Right. Or the feds to come knocking. Well, but you've got a vehicle, though, that that fuel system was built knowing there was going to be some alcohol content in it. Yeah, yeah. And, and there, from, that's why from, they're saying from E15. T- it says yeah. right in the in From the tank to fuel injectors and into the engine, it knows that it's going to see an alcohol content. So in that type of vehicle, if you stretch it to that E30, your first thing that would probably happen if it's not able to adjust enough is you're probably going to get a check engine light mm-hmm. because of some misfires, not misfires, but... Uh, Running lean. Running lean, and you don't want to do that long. If it starts doing that, then you want to just put some other unleaded back in it nope. and realize that yeah, it's probably not going to work in this one. Brittany, yeah. thanks very much for the call. So you would try it. Yes, I would. See how far, yep. see if it But I would be paying attention real yeah. close.
We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. 866-594-4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show. Get under the hood. Call the Motor Medics, 866-594-4150. 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Let's talk to Colin in South Dakota. Colin, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Morning, guys. Son-in-law inherited his father's 70 Mach 1. 351 automatic. Um, he had it restored, including uh, EFI and uh, Pertronic ignition distributor coil, and he finds it won't charge now. And he and I have looked about it, looked at it, talked about fixing it. Um, I had a 69 Mach 1 428 Cobra jet, so I'm fairly familiar with Ford stuff. And um, my concern is if the alternator uh, removed and tested and shown to be failed, would we be ahead to replace it with a alternator with an integrated regulator? On that car, I I probably would, just because you you've already done some changing to the car, and for the last I don't know 15 years, cars that are modified, unless it is 100 percent down to the chalk marks on the firewall and the original tires original. A lot of people just don't care anymore as far as value. So if you've changed the injection, you've changed the tires, you may have changed the wheels, go ahead and put something that Finish makes it. drivability. I, I would rather purchase a car myself today that has upgrades, like an internally regulated alternator, fuel injection, an overdrive trans that I could just drive every day and enjoy than worry about the pristine effects of, of perfection with you know the originality of the car. Um, I, I definitely, I definitely go that, that route and, and upgrade to that. And it's going to be easier for you to wire. That's what I was going to say. Operationally, there's, there, there's advantages that he should take advantage of with that system he's put in there. Mm -hmm. Correct, Russ? Oh, for sure. And it, you know, you can get an, an internally regulated alternator that's got a little higher amperage to it. That's, that's going to work like it's supposed to, because you want something you, for the fuel injection system on it, it requires a good, clean, stable voltage that is at a certain point that you may not get with an externally regulated system. The The regulators on those original cars were not as high. Even the ones that are adjustable, you can adjust them, but they still didn't keep the, the current where they, they weren't designed for fuel injection or any electronics. Even a digital radio, they were designed for an old basic car, which is cool back in the day. But now go with internally regulated for sure. One quick detail, should I just disconnect all the wires from the external regulator, tape them off, and leave them under there? And would there be one um, wire that I could use? I'm assuming that the internal regulated alternator will have one wire yep. to activate it or energize it. Yeah, you'll have the big hot wire for the field mm -hmm. on the back of the alternator, of course. And then you're going to have your, your uh, ignition wire that's going to go through your uh, your light or your gauge on the dash that's going to run down to the regulator, and it should be labeled. Take that wire and extend it to go to your alternator. And then the other wires, yes, cap them off good, fold them back inside of that loom, put a nice piece of tape around them so they look like they're the way they're supposed to, and you, most people are not even going to notice it's there. You can leave the regulator mounted exactly where it's at now, and it'll look like it's still still there doing its thing. Put a nice piece of tape around it is uh, that's loom. advice I can get behind. Right, Chris. So you've got a plastic loom mm -hmm. that's snapped over wires, and it does have tape around the end just to hold the end together. So you want to put a, you know, make it look clean. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, okay I'm with that. that. Let's uh, let's guess what color is this car. Don't tell us. I, oh, um, I think it's probably like a silverish color. I'm thinking it's that goldish. I was going to say color. gold. What color is it? 
Strike two. It is a beautiful dark blue, and it was his father's car, so it will never be sold. So modifications matter not. That that uh, is nice. Yeah, the blue. I wouldn't. I did. It seems like a lot of those mocks you see are are silver gold in that color yeah. palette, or like a green. You see quite a few of the greenish colored ones. I'm awesome. To, uh, let's think about that for a second. You picture back in your head cars like that that you've seen over your life that were factory colors. And it's it's hard to picture all of them. I've seen seen a black one, but I don't think it was factory. The one I'm thinking of, black with the silver stripes on. But you, you go back, and there were some colors that were really neat back in the day. When you see cars, it's kind of like watching a World War II film that's been colorized, actual footage, because <laughs> yeah. everything's in black and white. So when you're working on a like a '55 Chevy truck and you take a fender off and under the cowl, it's never been exposed to sun. And there's that robin egg blue it's color. bright and clear. And, and you can wax it and you go, wow, that's what <laughs> these look like when they were new. I think I, I'm picturing gold and silver because when we, when I started to realize, recognize them, they were all faded to some sort <laughs> of a goldish silver. It's a, it's a light blue, flat color. That's pretty much how they ended one, up. One last question before we let you go here. The, the 428 Cobra Jet car that you had, did you ever keep track of where that ended up at? No, I took the engine out and uh, sold it to some guys at Houston. <laughs> at the racetrack. Probably not not for what that engine's worth now. My goodness, when you think back to that stuff. I know that uh, the late Marv Underberg that worked for us, you know, such a good friend and, and longtime friend of ours. He, I remember him telling me a story one time when we were doing his annual review, how him and his wife had sold a, a uh, timing marker off the crankshaft on eBay for a 428 Cobra Jet. And it was like eighteen hundred bucks or something <laughs> stupid. I mean, it was just for, for the pointer. <laughs> it was just crazy. I was like, "Oh my goodness!" And he well, had, and he had three of them at the time. <laughs> Colin, thanks. If you enjoyed your time on the end of the hood show, sorry we ruined it right at the end. <laughs> thanks very much for the call. Let's talk to Tim. You're on the end of the hood show, Tim. What can we do for you? Hey guys, uh, I got a uh, uh, F one fifty. In, in uh it's a 16 and they get that little grind in the front end somebody told me it's not the it's a four-wheel drive not pushing all the way back in or out i put a what they call a four-wheel drive solenoid in the other day which got like one electronic hookup and two vacuum hookups and it didn't seem to help is there something else i can do or do i need to take that in well it, that system is vacuum commanded to operate it and it does have that solenoid is where the vacuum and release takes place. If yeah. it is, if it is giving the correct, you can pull the hose off at the hub and measure it. And if it has got the correct amount of vacuum down there, same as the engine vacuum, basically, and then no vacuum yeah. as you switch it on and off, then the next part of it is the the hub itself. And we see many of those fail. We have to replace the hub, the teeth, the whole the whole thing, both both ends of it, both the actuator and the the teeth on the on the hub there. Because they'll start to, when the vacuum starts to go away and you start having an issue with that system or solenoid fails, it starts to grind those teeth. Um, and then, yes, it would have to go in or have, you know, you could replace it yourself, but it's a it's a bigger driveway job for sure. Is that something with that age? How many miles have you got on that truck? About 82. That's doesn't, right in that doesn't, age. I know it doesn't seem like it should be breaking yet. It shouldn't, but we see them as low as 50,000 miles that are three or four but years old. It just doesn't seem like it should be breaking yet. I mean, you, I, I know, Russ, I'm all with you on this because we get this call a few times a year. and comes from the control system failing and wearing out the part. It's, it's equivalent to having a manual transmission going down the road, put it in neutral, and then try to cram it in gear in reverse while you're going on the road and grind it. You, if you do that enough, it's going to tear it up, and that's what's happening in that front end. So you don't want to delay this either because it's no. going to just get worse and worse. Well, if you just leave it, it's going to stay the same if you don't switch it. But when you're operating it, it's going to get worse every single time. You Will you it. ever – have you seen one get so bad that you lose four-wheel drive? Oh, definitely. Yep. That's usually when they come in. They say, hey, I was oh, making sure, a noise yeah. for a year, and now it doesn't work. There we go. And that would be just when you need the four-wheel drive. Shop right? around, though. <laughs> I got a guy who got a quote for $800 to put a hub on the front of one of those the other day. And I looked, and I'm like, we do that for six. So what's – so just – Check your prices before you jump at one. Tim, thanks very much for the call.
We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. The phone number to reach us, 866-594-4150. The Under the Hood Show is brought to you by Sturdivant's. In the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. Welcome back to the Under the Hood Show. The phone number to reach us 866 594 4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Russ Evans, Shannon Nordstrom here to answer your questions. I'm here to answer your calls. And if you join the Hoodie Fan Club or subscribe to the YouTube channel, if you join the Hoodie Fan Club and subscribe to the YouTube channel, you could win a hoodie. There you go. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go you, ahead. YouTube it. Right. A lot of people don't like the, the F word. Hmm. <laughs> Facebook? Yeah. <laughs> All right, change it up. Rick Bewley is the winner of the hoodie this week. Congratulations from all of us here under the hood and from our friends over at Universal Technical Institute where they can get you trained up to be an automotive technician, a motorcycle mechanic, a marine mechanic, a welder collision repair specialist. They got all the right teachers in all the right places with campuses across the United States. And I would think it's in demand and that <sighs> it's going to be changing over the next few years. There's going to be a, a big oh, shift. There is a change. So now is the time to get in. And it is in demand right now. We have uh, a few years back, we talked to you about a company that was, uh, they were, very much looking mm-hmm. for technicians, and they are again. So I don't know. We'll, we might might talk about them as well. But there's a lot of people, a lot of people out there in need, and you've got to be you got to be trained. You got to know what you're doing. Eight six six five nine four four one five zero. Let's talk to Randy. You're on the end of the hood show, Randy. What can we do for you? Well, I got a my brother-in-law has a 2005 Buick with Saber, and when it when he drives it, it's cool. It's all right. If it, back here a couple of weeks ago when we had the 80s, a couple 80 degree days, he drove it, and it, you know after he drove like 15 miles or whatever, it would start uh, shifting real rough. But when it's colder, that is fine. But it, it, uh, when it's hot, it shifts real rough. If you, if you had any ideas? I guess try to zero in on this a little bit more. Is it like slamming into gear or is it shifting erratically where it's slipping gears, where it's, you know, kind of uh, flashing some RPMs at shift or explain that a little bit further? Well, the way he explained it to me (laughs) was that I don't know that it skipped gears, but it just, it ran into the next gear. You know, it wouldn't be a smooth Transition, each, you know, one, two, four, or whatever. It would kind of go on and wham, and go in the next gear, and wham, and go in the next gear. That's pretty good. It's going it's, in at full uh, pressure. It has about 92,000 92, miles on it, and uh, it's, the fluid's fine. It's clean. Now, what you got going on there is that that transmission is likely going in at full pressure. It's got a fault inside of it. If you were to scan it, you'd see there'd be a code in there. Whether or not the check engine light's on or not, it can still do it. And it yeah. will turn the pressure all the way up in the transmission in order to prevent the transmission from slipping. So if it sees a slip due to something like a solenoid that's not functioning properly, a valve that is sticking in the valve body, or the likely cause by, and I get that likely cause by being in a shop where we're working on dozens of these things that have come to this point where the clutches have started slipping and this has happened, uh, where it is the more likely cause, but it could be a solenoid or a valve hanging up or even a computer issue with it. But if, if you have anything, any sense of slip in there that the computer's picking up, it's going to turn that, that force motor in there all the way up. It's going to give full fluid pressure, and that's what the – the bang you're going to have is if you can turn the key off and restart it and it goes away and it runs smooth for just a little bit and then it does it again, it's sensing that again. So you'll need to need to check it and see. We've had plenty of these things come in where we've looked and, and found a solenoid was out and we've been able to replace that and it's fixed it or 
tear it apart, work on the valve body, get it freed up, and uh, you can go on from there. But at certain points, we had one the other day we looked at it, and it needed a valve body, or it needed to at least be taken out and worked on. Well, the transmission had 168, 178,000 miles on it. And the cost of pulling that down and pulling the side cover and the valve body and, and working through the valves in it and getting it going was almost identical to the cost of a certified used transmission that came with a year warranty with the covered parts and labor with unlimited mileage. So it made no sense for the customer to fix what they had and then get no warranty because there could be something else. If we were to fix the valve body, it, we would warranty the part of the valve body we fixed, but not the rest of it or the rest of the solenoids or the clutches and the transmission. But when you put the whole used unit in, you're covered. So with a car of that age, going with a used part would be um, the, the more economical idea to but get it going. I will say, though, if you, and we bring this up a number of if times. You if you find that yeah, it's something If internal. that fluid's still looking good and this car is that low a mileage at 92000 I would definitely not waste any more time before getting it in for an inspection. Right. Because if it is one of the other circumstances that are causing it, which let's, let's hope for that, let's get it fixed because you're probably going to get another... 50, 60,000 miles out of that is no problem at all. But if you let it keep slipping, or if that's what's happening, you will eventually kill it. And it, it's, it's, yeah, that's the thing. You don't want to let it go thinking it is one thing and then you're right. going to make it very, that very, true. Very much want to get that checked out. Russ's last question before we leave this one, is there anything ambient temperature-wise that there's no sensor or anything? It just must be the way that it's affecting the operations inside of that. So it might be such a thing where you bring it in, they check the electronics, they, you know, give it a good once over and then, you know, check pressures and then maybe put a conditioner in there. Cause that is actually quite low mileage for an 05. Maybe there's some stuff that's just hanging up and not shifting right in the warm weather affects it in such a way or in the warm temperatures. So let's definitely get that thing checked out. That help you out there, Randy. All right. Yes. Thank you. Thanks very much for the call. 866 594 Four one five zero. What's caught your attention in the automotive world? Well, let's talk a little bit about timing belts. Timing belts. Yeah. They still put okay. those on cars. Not very many. There used but to be a lot of them. Do you have a timing belt? How do you know? How can you find that out? I don't. I know that for a fact. I have. How a, do you know it for a fact? Because I had the timing chain worked on the other day. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there, there you go. You're right. So. Uh, you don't, but you've got to find out if you have it. If you have one, let's talk a little bit about the time, the difference between a timing belt and a timing chain. Yeah. So cars have a connection between the crankshaft and the camshaft or multiple camshafts up to four, depending on the car. Bottom of the engine, top of the engine. And that physical connection is made with a chain almost identical to a bicycle chain. You, you, you picture it that way in your head. Or a belt. Just put a belt on in place of the chain on your bicycle. So if that breaks, there's a, a specific timing sequence that needs to be addressed in the engine. When the pistons go down, and you can, you can watch videos on YouTube that will show you exactly how this sure works, can. but the pistons are down. The valve is open, piston's coming back up, and before the piston gets to contact that valve, when it's pushing exhaust gases out, the valve is closing, and it's up into the head, out of the way, boom, good to go. It's kind of like keeping your fingers out of the car door when you slam it. you got your hand on ah, the door, ugh. you're closing the door, you, pull your, hand did that. Out. Yeah. Yeah, you pull your hand out before you get the door shut, right? Well, what happens if you leave your fingers in the door? It's the same thing as leaving the valve down. But your fingers may recover a little quicker than the engine. If that engine contacts, oh. that piston contacts the valves, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt your wallet more than it's going to hurt your fingers. Maybe your finger's pulling out all that money because it's going to yeah. grab it <laughs> so yeah. much out of your wallet, and it's really going to hurt. Repetitive motion right check. industry. Exactly. So Injury. You've got to know first, do I have a timing belt? If you don't have one, don't worry about it. But if you do have one, then we've got, to, we've got to start asking questions. Now, in your owner's manual, it may say it may have a supplement for the engine you have, depending, because some cars, when equipped with one engine, will have a timing belt. With a different engine, they'll have a timing chain. There you go. Electric cars, neither. <laughs> None, no moving parts there. 
uh, in that realm for Cam. So, uh, and the timing belt is a belt just like any other belt, right? Yeah. And the timing chain is inside. It's a metal chain, and it's enclosed in a, right. in a housing. Now, some cars had their timing belts enclosed in aluminum housing that you okay. had to pull off. And some cars back in the 80s, early 90s, had both a chain and a belt. Love that. Like mm. the Grand Prix or the Lumina that had oh, the 3-4 three, three, four four dual overhead, overhead cam. cam. I was trying to think which motor you're That's talking about. That's kind of a tricky one because I had somebody come in and say, I think my timing belt broke, and I looked at him like, what? And this was a like a very new car. It was two years old. And like, oh, sure enough, it was. And it was the we found out at that time they put both in the car. But that was decades ago. But you need to find out. So ask your mechanic that works on the car. They can look that up for you. Or you can take your vehicle identification number from your windshield or your doorpost and look at the uh, run it on the Internet. It'll give you a VIN decoder. They're all over the place for free. And it'll tell you what engine you have. And let's say it comes up and it says it's a 2.4 Pontiac engine. And it'll say single overhead, dual overhead cam, um, timing chain, timing belt. Once you know if it has a belt, here's where you got to be careful. Car says it has a belt. How many miles are on your car? The people who build the belts, Gates is one of them. They're experts at Gates uh, at belts you, and hoses. You've heard the name belts and hoses yeah. and Gates together many, many years. Decades. So these folks are saying typically five years, 60,000 miles is the average life for a belt. So when they say that, but a manufacturer says, oh, about 100,000 miles or so, I tend to lean towards the belt manufacturer because the belt manufacturer, I mean, they want to sell more belts, of course, but they also want to protect your investment. That's what they built their reputation on. The manufacturer, most of these cars are three or 36,000 mile warranty. So if it's out of warranty, they are not responsible in one bit when they're, when it's failed. So you've got to make your decision. And you, another good way to make a decision is ask your local mechanic. Because I can tell you in our shop, certain cars that have been going eight, nine years, we've never seen a timing belt failure in them. They've worked well. In our part of the country, different part of the country, you may have seen it earlier time due to heat or extreme cold. So you've got it. You've got to get that relationship built with your technician at your shop. Your and the timing advisor. chain, theoretically, should, should last, last the life of the engine, but if you have an engine, um, dual overhead cam engines, the 3.6 Chevrolet engines, the Ford EcoBoost, they have had some early timing chain failures that should not occur. Part of it is because of the poor design of the, the product. It's just not strong enough to handle it, uh, the, the workings of the engine. But also part of it is due to lubrication and maintenance and people not sticking to what they should when when i hear someone say i follow recommended maintenance on my car well they wait until the light comes on and sometimes they may wait till the light comes on and then go another two months that's that's not good maintenance so also on that follow the recommendations of and the oil your, changes right yeah I mean, that's regular, what such a big deal regular oil changes and always use a very good quality oil and especially in the dual qual uh, dual overhead cam engines partner liquid molly has an incredible synthetic oil that'll help protect those chains but you've always got to follow recommended maintenance and talk to your mechanic and then sometimes they go to replace the chain and realize it's good it just needs a new guide is that what i needed yes your yeah. car all your car needed was a guide it was yeah. completely worn out we're going to take a break when we come back we want to hear from you the phone number to reach us 866-594-4150 this is the under the hood show appointment each week to hear the Nordstrom's Under the Hood show. 866-594-4150 from the autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood show. Let's go to California and talk to Sal. You're on the Under the Hood show. Sal, what can we do for you? Uh, yeah, thank you guys for taking my call. I appreciate it. Um, I have a 2008 Mercedes it's an S63. It's an AMG. Um, right now, the short story is um, I'm not getting any signal to the S terminal 
on the starter coming from the ECU. Um, the ECU seems in working order. All the fuses are intact and working, and everything else is working electrically. I'm just not receiving power to the S uh, terminal at the starter. How long have you owned this big bad sedan? <laughs> Too long, about a year now. That, that, those are some cruisers. <laughs> Too I mean, long. That, that, uh, what, oh, uh, yes. what motor is in that again? And remind me. It's uh, at the time it was the strongest uh, naturally aspirated vehicle uh, in the world. It's a 6.3 uh, NA liter uh, V8 um, uh, naturally aspirated. It pushes out about 530 horsepower stock. Um, I've got a tune on it. It's pushing about 560. Now, you know this car because you've had it for over a year here. I'm, I'm taking him down a trip here just you know, because this problem is interesting, but the car is more interesting to me. <laughs> when, that, when that car was new, do you remember what the list price was? Uh, yeah, uh, funny story too. It was about 120. Um, a funny story. El Chapa owned that vehicle. It was kind of funny. I thought the car you have or the same car. Yes. No, the same, same type of vehicle. Oh, Cause if you had El Chapa's car, <laughs> gonna hang up I'm going <laughs> to, not sure if we should be talking to you. <laughs> you, you better, you better yeah, start yeah, checking I'm the quarter panels. It. We're going to do a, a close inspection of that automobile <laughs> right. for you. Yeah. So, okay, so he had that same car back in the day is, is what you're saying. Yes. And he probably paid cash for it. <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. It's probably given to him by a friend. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, so 120. Okay, so now we're going to go take this a little further, and then we'll get to your question because I enjoy this stuff. So $120,000 car approximately in 2008. Think mm -hmm. about that. Uh -huh. that, that's a high yeah. end car. Yeah. In pristine sure in pristine good condition today, what is it worth? Is it forty five? Um, I paid I got a good deal on it. It had eighty thousand miles. It was in very good condition. Every button worked. It ran great. Um it costed us sixteen with taxes out the door, everything. We were looking at twenty three. Um I ended up putting down thirteen, so I owed ten. I thought you said forty five hundred, Russ. No, oh, a thousand. Oh, I was okay, thinking right, thousand. I looked at you like, no. So <laughs> you can get a smoking good deal right now on some of these exotic. I'll call them exotic. Uh, yes. Not supercars necessarily, but super exotic sports Close. cars. I've always wanted an Aston Martin because they look yeah, super that'd be cool. Fun. They are so cheap right yeah. now. Like you can get an 08, uh Aston Martin, super nice car for. Eighteen to twenty five thousand. You're like, are you but kidding? you would have to they buy it. Hundred grand. You, you'd have to buy it because then you could figure out how to fix the right. things that break. Because yeah. most people can't. That's why they're so affordable. Nobody can afford to fix Th that, yet. Yes. Yes. Because I, mean, I I know this a little bit because I we've got an 06 Range Rover. And I thought Sport. I chastised you when you bought yeah. that, and you said, "Oh, it had a little water damage." <laughs> oh, don't buy that. But, but I mean, the, but he's been fixing it himself. Right. Well, I, I haven't. I little little help from from Jim Tramby at Classic Imports. The last thing we did, but he's. You know, he's slowing down down there what he wants to do too so we're, we're running out of places in our market that can even plug into some of this stuff if you don't have a dealer and the dealer's really not interested and we've got a few we've got a few tools that will work on some of these but on those cars we are so busy with everyday ford chevys buick hondas it's like that you can't no get that. we're yeah. not going to work on it because they can I mean, they cost more money to work on, and they can be a bit of a mousetrap. Yes, they can be. They can be <laughs> problematic. They could be a big winner or a big loser as far as price. But now, your car, did this suddenly just drop out and lose? You lost lost your power to the S terminal. Yeah, you know, there's a long story. I don't want to go into it with you guys. I know we're time restricted, but um, there was some things that were, happened before that. The injector got stuck open. It hydro locked. Um, I cleaned all that out. Um, sucked out all that carbon out of the cylinders with some sea foam and a vacuum. It's clean in there. Um, the engine turns over by hand, um, but I'm not getting any power to the S terminal. Okay, I'm wondering. So you did some of these repairs, and then all of a sudden, sure. no power. I'm an idiot. Well, no, 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 no not at all. Maybe. I'm, I'm wondering if. <laughs> no, he's fine. <laughs> no, I'm okay. wondering if the hydrolog situation put a bunch of stress on this circuit, of course. Well, before he knew it, it could have shut down the starting circuit.
So I would first, uh, two things I would do, I would scan it and see if there's any codes in the system and then clear them all and see if it cranks hey, because it could protect they itself. They take that star, they take that star Mercedes uh, yep. Um, yep. software. Yeah. Yep. And do that because here's what will happen. If you unplugged things like injectors and then you cleaned it out, which is exactly what you're supposed to do. If it sees that the injector had a fault or the engine was loaded up, it's going to prevent it from starting. It's going to shut down the okay. starting circuit just in the same way that a misfire will shut down a cylinder. It'll, it'll kill fuel to it and kill spark, things like that in order to protect the engine. So it could be simpler than you think. It might just be as simple as clearing the codes and now it runs. Or you might look at it and say, oh, you know what? This injector's not completely connected on a, on a car or a coil is not connected on a car or a sensor is not connected on the car. And then you can clear the codes after you plug them in. So it, it could be, uh, that's kind of the route I'm going. Cause if you had said that this just lost power randomly, it could get really expensive because they have <laughs> different modules on this car that Shannon and I worked on, on a, on a Mercedes. Similar a, age, similar design as far as the way the engine's set up. And yeah, it was very expensive. It, it, it had been hit by lightning and it, killed a lot of components but on your car i bet it's going to be probably as simple as you've either still got something unplugged on one of the connectors or it's just not completely clicked together and it needs a code cleared or just the codes you know what chris we just had a reference to something we haven't talked about for a while what's that the injector connector the injector connector does this one have a protector it will when you click it together you'll slide that protector okay. over and keeps right. it from coming We haven't apart. had that for a while. No, it's been a, a good long while since we're we've so had that. childish we can get uh -huh. lost on this for another 15 right. minutes. So let's go totally. along. But we won't. Does that help you out there, Sal? Yeah, but here's the thing, guys. Um, real quick, with that injector connector, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> when I went to go clean out those injectors, yep. I shot 9 volts through the connector. I chopped it off, shot 9 volts through it to sh clean out the injectors, right? Okay. Um, well, okay. Um, when I put that connector back on, I think maybe there was some reverse poli polarity, and it kept that injector open and filled the cylinder up with fluid. I got you. Now that would set a code. You might have wrecked her. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it shouldn't, it really shouldn't have damaged the computer, though, because it's coming out, not back in the other way. So. I, I'm I'm aiming for clearing the codes. Before he called, he should have checked her. Chris, you right? Gotta stop. I mean, what? No, stop it, Chris. <laughs> Wreck him. Just so kill them. Get get into that computer first and see what you've got for codes, and and then uh, see if it might be as simple as just clearing them now that you've got the polarity. Correct. And then if that's not it, you got to go to the next thing, right? I mean, that yeah. that's the first thing to see if you can get the power back and see if then you have to fix that, whatever it was that caused it, right? Yep. Thanks for calling in. I'm glad that we could chat about your car a little bit. Sounds fun, but not fun right now. <laughs> That'll do it for this hour of the Under the Hood Show. Hour two is coming up. If you'd like to get on hold and join us next hour, 866-594-4150. That'll do it for this hour of the Under the Hood Show. Brought to you by Sturtevitz. You're listening to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show with the Motor Medics, Shannon Nordstrom and Russ the Super Tech Evans. Shannon is an ASE engine and parts specialist, and Russ is an ASE master certified technician with extensive factory drivability training. Join the Motor Medics for fun and free automotive advice with real world solutions to everyday automotive problems. The Under the Hood Show is heard weekly on this and other great radio stations across the U.S. Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. With Russ Evans, this is Shannon Nordstrom thanking you for tuning in to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. Have a great day and remember, PTLA. The opinions heard on this program, based on the many years of experience of Russ and Shannon, are offered for entertainment value only and as a guide to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive, Inc.
Now, let's go under the hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood show from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood show. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Hey, thanks for joining us under the hood. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to answer your calls at 866-594-4150. What's caught your attention? I know you did some goat roping in the last week. Was that what you were doing? I think you. It wasn't goat roping. It was, it oh, was sillier and no. funnier. Goat roping was I a joke. That was a joke, but then I, I you're right. I saw yeah. a Facebook post this with is him and more, a goat. This is more ridiculous wasn't than he goat kissing roping. The goat. I didn't kiss he was a goat. Right there. That thing was three inches from his face. Mm-hmm. It was like right here. What'd you do? Don't be silly. What'd you do? Do yoga with a billy. <laughs> You did goat yoga. I did. <laughs> my my wife, the call screener, she's uh-huh. she's screening calls today. Our producer Doug is uh, starting to feel a little better. We hopefully get him back on. Was the, that really? Back in he's the team. laughing his butt off now. Was that really the 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 scheme? Don't be silly. Do yoga with a Billy. No, I just made that up quick. There used to be bumper stickers yeah. on cars. Jasper, Minnesota had goat races yeah. when we were kids, yeah. and it was don't be silly, race your Billy. And so mm-hmm. I just kind of. Twisted that, that a little yeah. bit. We had a car come that was good, into wasn't our it? shop a few months ago, and on the door it said, Laugh Yoga. Yeah. This. Well, I tell you what. I'll give you the quick story, I and I'll even, to our Under the Hood Show Facebook page, I'll share one of the pictures of my uh, my short family minus one doing goat yoga. Mm-hmm. And just for the record, I Who don't. Who was the smart one? <laughs> <laughs> just for the record, well, Riley wasn't with us. Just for the record, I don't do yoga regularly. Okay. Not a normal thing in my life. It's I do, hard, isn't it? I do. You, ex, yeah. I've you done, do I've goat done yoga it. more than you do regular yoga. I do. Okay. I've done yoga in my life as part of P90X. Yes, that was kind that's of a big what thing. I did it with, and I went, this is impossible. Yeah, and it took too long. I didn't have time. No patience for it. That was my excuse. It's too mm-hmm. hard. Right. It was hard. That's what it is. Yeah. It's very hard. But um, the my daughter's out there going to college in Phoenix, and where they're at, and I'll, as quick as I can tell her and her friends saw the goat yoga. <laughs> they went to go do it, and they sent pictures. And my wife and my my youngest, who's thirteen, said, "Oh, that looks awesome." <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, we just <laughs> about didn't get it because we didn't sign up in time. And we we called the number, and the lady that was in charge was nice enough to text us back and say, "Hey, you're from here from South Dakota. Come on down, do a drop in." Yeah, right. Give us some money. Oh, we were. Oh, yeah, you were that, almost not able to. Good thing you're. Well, we're gonna have to charge you. More. Felt better. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, we went down there and we did goat yoga, and this was the original goat yoga. Better than oh. them saying, you want to do what? Yeah, I guess you can come do yoga with our goats. Original <laughs> goat yoga. This lady that started it was on American Ninja Warrior in 2015, yep. and they kind of made a big deal out of her because she used her goats to train. Yep. And <laughs> so it became kind of a thing, talking about these goats, because I don't know that she must have done pretty well. That was about the time you were thinking about I, Oh, yeah. I'm trying to remember who that was. I, I, do, I can picture the person in my head right now, and I'm forgetting I think her, the I think her name was April, maybe. Uh, or was that the other lady? I'm looking at my wife through the window here. But, but uh, anyway, <laughs> while she was doing this goat training, another lady from the same area <laughs> Did paddleboard yoga, which also sounds very hard. Oh, that sounds I've got impossible. one. And you could drown. <laughs> I, just, I just bought a new paddleboard. So I want to see some yoga, Russ. <laughs> and so uh, she got in contact with the other lady and said, hey, you got these goats. I can do yoga. Have you ever thought about doing goat yoga? So this is kind of where it all started. <laughs> and so, yes, we did yoga, and it was fun. It was about 45 minutes of beginner yoga and then it kind of became a petting zoo. Sure. And as you're doing your different yoga poses, the goats, for some, would jump right up on them. And other ones, you'd go catch a goat and put it on your sure. family member, and it would just stay there, or else it would jump off, or else you'd be scared it was going to pee or poop on you because they always raise their tail when they are about ready to jump, and okay. you'd swear there's you something else going to happen. Okay. And one of the pictures, I'm down on all fours kind of doing a yoga pose, like a downward dog or something like that, or act like I know what I'm talking mm-hmm. about. And... The goat is on me going ready to jump up. It's tails up, and I'm wearing a shirt from one of our partners we worked with before in the past podium, and on the back of the shirt, it's got little hash marks that go down between my shoulder blades just on the shirt, and one of my friends wrote, it looks like you already got something between your shoulder blades. It looks (laughs) like the goat already Already did its thing. Left it, yeah. And uh, I was tricked at first, too. I had to go look at the shirt. 
Oh, and, and, and I'm like, oh yeah, girl, gosh, I'm glad there's hash marks. Sitting down there. in the basement, ready to yeah, because my hair was kind of sweaty too, and you know, and, <laughs> and uh, it was kind of a bad deal. So anyway, I'll I'll share some pictures. But yes, I did do goat yoga. It was fun. Eight six six five nine four four one five zero. Let's talk to Dennis. You're on the end of the hood show, Dennis. What can we do for you? Hi guys, I enjoy your show a lot. I listen all the time. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I got a what do you I got a I got a sixty nine Pontiac with uh it's got the TH four hundred transmission. Uh I'm thinking about either a, a gear mender or a different transmission. Uh, what do you what's your guys' opinion on a gear mender? What, well, what do you I I've got one of those and I I also had a sixty nine Pontiac, but it was a <laughs> it was a Grand Prix. What's your what do you got? I got a Firebird. Oh, I had one of those too. Um Yours is probably in way better condition anyway, than mine was. My, Low geared. What kind of gears you got? The problem is I get, I got 373s. Okay. Yeah. Well, 373 with the, with a stock height or around tire on that car is it's going to spin pretty fast and overdrive would be really nice in that car. You made it sound like the, the roundness of the, the, was the, was a type <laughs> no, the tire, the right? Height, right yeah. height of the, yeah. the around or so, uh, like you I know, you. around that height, not round <laughs> like a tire. So, which engine do you have in this? Car? You got a four hundred in there. You got a three fifty. What do you got? Well, it's it's a it's a I got a stroker in it. I it's a four twelve now. I, I stroked the three fifty. So it's got the Pontiac three fifty in there, or Chevrolet three fifty. What do you got? Pontiac three fifty. Okay. Oh, he spent, he spent some money to build his motor. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm asking because you've got different bell housings available for different transmissions. If it was a Chevrolet, I'd be telling you to get a 700 R4 trans. Uh, you can get one that's been built up a little bit by TCI or somebody like that. Throw that in there. They do sell overdrive transmissions. Now, the gear vendors, we just put a brand new gear vendors unit in for a guy with a pickup truck, and I really like the new one. It works a lot smoother than the one I have in my own truck as far as the shifting in and out. You could use that, um, and then you can split some gears and stuff with it. But you're going to spend probably, for the unit itself, I think you're in that four forty five hundred dollars range, Ooh. something like that, I think is what he spent. So if you're going to put... You could have a transmission built. Yeah, I I would be, for a cruiser like that, that's not a truck, I would almost, if do you, would you like more power out of the thing? Or does it have plenty of power for you? Oh, not necessarily. I just I just like some, uh, to be able to cruise, you know, I'm, I'm turning about three grand, about 60. Oh, yeah, then that's that's about where you should be. So look on, look at TCI's website for transmissions. And there's, uh, there's quite a few other transmission companies out there too, but TCI is a pretty good one. And look at, uh, or the Comp Cam's website too, they have some trans stuff, but look at the, the transmissions they have in the overdrive. They've got some four speeds. They've got some you might be able six to get a, speeds. You might be able to get a 204R built for it yeah. to go behind that Pontiac. I mean, there's different, so there's, there's different ones of available, but I, I think they have a, like a 500 horsepower, uh, ready 450 foot pounds torque 204R that's been modified. Those things were a joke when they first came out. We'd be like, oh, you don't want one of those. It can barely handle, you know, 200 horsepower back in the 80s, but now they can really build them pretty strong. I think that's going to be your best bang for the buck to get one going. And also, don't forget uh, a, a local trans shop. I was you've just got a good say local trans shop and tell them, I've got a powerful Firebird. I need a, they call it a BOP, Buicles, Pontiac, Bell Housing, Trans. For this Pontiac 350, can you build me a 204R with the with the upgrades in it to get me that the horsepower and torque I need? And then you'll have an overdrive and be you'll you'll be happy with the way the car cruises. And you're going to want someone local to be able to adjust it if things. It's going to be you minor. Wanna, yeah. You build it, it's about done. Okay. There's no extra fancy electronics with that one. Dennis, thanks very much for the call. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. 866-594. 4150, you're listening to the Under the Hood Show. Welcome back to the Under the Hood Show, 866 594 4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show, 866 
594-4150. What's caught your attention in the automotive world? Well, you know I, what? Oh, I was looking up Joe Azuzu. Oh, yeah, okay. we were talking, talking about figure that out if he was, would, It's not. David it's not. Leisure. Yeah. He was on that show with the St. Bernard on NBC on Thursday nights. Empty Nest. Does, uh... How about that? that, that I, didn't, how many of our, I didn't know that. Recall? I didn't know that 30 seconds ago. How many of our listeners would know Joe Azuzu? Hi, I'm Joe Azuzu. And He's you lying. know that, that yeah. catch the speeding. Uh, I'm oh, going to give you a million dollars. I'm thinking of Super Dave Osborne is dead, right? Yeah, he just yeah, died not too long that's ago. That's the guy I was confused. So, okay. we had, so we had Super Dave Osborne, which was kind of a, a cool thing in the 80s and the 90s. Cars, different things, stunts. Joe Azuzu, and then we had the guy that was, in, I remember him from playing an overboard that did all those commercials for the Dodge, the, uh, oh, you know the car I'm talking about on your Dodge Intrepid doing 88 miles an hour? You remember, so Dodge Intrepid, when it first came out, now we think of them like, really, an Intrepid? When that first year They were Intrepid, futuristic. They put uh-huh. the car on a dyno running 88 miles an hour and put, champagne glasses stacked on the hood oh, and they said yeah. you remember that they're like yeah. it runs so smooth it can drive oh. no wow it's an intrepid how you about know, your news it's got to be more interesting <laughs> this is, you know this is all good <laughs> hey chris russ shannon ask yourself uh what is the uh, what what's something you've sold 42 that, that you've tried to sell for the longest time and then oh. finally sold it and how long was that that's a I, something you said. I'm going to sell this, and then you kept trying to sell it, and you kept trying to sell it, and a period of time passed that you're embarrassed to say, and then you finally sold it. I, I can't it, remember anymore, but I do know the, like the last six items I've put on Facebook Marketplace that I thought would never sell sold to the first person in like ten minutes, and I thought yeah. it's there's insane. Some, for there's big some craziness money. going on there. Big money. So. I remember us having back in the early days of the business. A my dad, if he's listening right now, he's embarrassed. But we had a grain truck that had a burned cab on it. It was a big project, and he just he thought for sure that somebody should buy this grain truck. Put and it on the marketplace, twelve thousand dollars. I think we. <laughs> I want to say it was like five years we had this for sale, and then somebody finally took it, <laughs> <laughs> and he just wasn't willing to discount it because he knew the value of the box and stuff, and he wouldn't discount it. Well, here's a story from the the uh, automotive. You got something, Chris? You got anything? No. Nope, nope. All right, Automotive News, Final Assembly, March edition. At long last, a buyer, a Lotus dealer, sells a Lotus Evora after seven years. Huh. Unofficially, according to Car and Driver, the oldest new car for sale. Unless you went to the Lambert auction, which he never <laughs> sold anything. <laughs> yeah, there we go. But uh, um, this is at a Lotus dealer in New London, Connecticut, and they just recently sold this vehicle last month for about Seventy thousand dollars, roughly twenty thousand dollars below its sticker price. I think I'm not kidding. Let me. I think that within the last year, year and a half, my son and I were talking about Avora. So I went on and looked at how much they were. And you saw this car for sale. And I saw a brand new one that was five or six years old. And I we talked about it. I, I think we we saw that car for sale. Yeah, the dealership's general manager. Steve Plona said the car sat so long because he refused to discount it as much as other dealers were doing at the time. It was a protest to some schemes of the pricing people had, he told the magazine. when he, This was Car and Driver when they talked to him. I think it's an undervalued brand. The sticker inside the door shows a December of 2013 manufacturing date. The tires, battery, and engine oil were all original. Not sure about that oil thing. <laughs> Plona said he changed all other fluids, plugged in a trickle charger, and overfilled the tires. He kept the car in climate-controlled storage, driving it outside every so often to keep it in good running condition. He's now looking for someone to take a 2018 Avora 400 off his hands. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. That's, uh, that's quite a while to have, have it sitting there. Oh, I bet it It's a pretty you. good chunk of money, too. For sure. 866-594-4150. We're going all the way over to Albert Lee. We're going to talk to Al. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Al, what can we do for you? Hi. Yeah, I have a 1985 Jeep CJ. I have a plow on the front end. 
and it's really, really weird. Whenever there's a load, like I'm pushing snow, I can take my foot off the gas pedal, and it, it just keeps accelerating. And then when I lift up the blade, or I put it in neutral, lift the blade up, and there's no, you know, pressure on, or no, you know, it's not being under, you no, know, not wanting to plow, it'll idle. It'll idle when there's no uh, pressure on the plow. But when I, as soon as I put that plow down and start pushing snow, it just accelerates and accelerates and accelerates. I lift the plow up, it'll idle. Um, I don't understand what's going on there. So if you're stopped and you put the plow down and do not touch the throttle, it just sits there, right? But once you step on the throttle, then it starts to take off on its own, right? It takes off on its own if there's you know <clears throat> pressure on the plow. Yep. If, there's, if, it's, if I'm not pushing any snow, it'll just stay idle or it'll drive right. But as soon as there's pressure on that plow, it accelerates. It's just it's dangerous, actually. Yep. I have to put it in neutral when I want to, you know, I'm pushing snow up close to the garage. I've got to quick put it in neutral, lift the blade up, then it'll idle down. It sounds uh, to huh. me, so if, if you come to a stop, if you, if you hold your foot on the brake and really hold it hard and get that thing to come to a stop, will it, can you get it to stop without your foot on the throttle, but it's still revved up pretty high or pushing pretty high? Or can you put it into neutral and the engine won't blow up, but it's revved up like at 2,000 RPM? Yeah, if I put it in neutral, it'll, it'll uh, slow down. It will. It is hard to it is hard to stop it with the brake. Well, I don't think a vacuum issue. No, no? I'm, you got something I'm, else going on here. I'm Russ? thinking he's got something binding when he starts to push it, and this engine moves. Have you looked at the motor mounts, the engine mounts on this engine? I have not. I would take a look at that because it sounds to me like the engine is rocking, and it's rocking enough that it's moving the throttle cable. The only way to verify that physically uh, or with somebody watching would be is if it was in my shop and I had technicians here, I would open up the hood and I would look at the throttle because I can see it right there on the driver's side of the engine. And I would look at the throttle and I'd watch it and I'd have you put it into gear and you should probably be able to duplicate this without the plow, but just by putting, you might be able to do it by holding your foot on the brake and the gas at the same time. And then watch the engine. If it moves off to one side quite a ways, like an inch or two, that engine mount is bad. But when it does that, it should also torque on that throttle cable and open it up. And then when you put okay. it back in neutral, you should see it drop down to idle. It's the only thing I can think with a with a electric. That know, makes that makes that makes very good sense. I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna try that here in a little bit. <laughs> Take a peek at that because an- if you had told me this thing was an electric throttle vehicle. Boy, we, everything's off the yeah, table. We're exactly. like, whoa, now what? I I would have no, yeah, we'd have to come up with something crazy on that. But, yeah, that, this thing, I'm thinking you have an issue with that because I had I had a Mustang, and the motor mounts were not super strong. And if I would accelerate really hard when I was changing gears with the manual trans, I as I would give it some throttle, I could feel – a little bit of movement in my clutch pedal if I rested my foot on it because of the manual linkage, and also my throttle would would move just a little bit when you could you'd, feel when it. You'd fl- you'd stand on it like three quarters, and you could feel as the engine would get, um, you know, it would it would have a lot of torque, but when it got up to that a certain speed where there'd be less torque because you're at you know moving down the road at velocity, then the engine would kind of back off a little bit because the as it rocked back the cable so that came to my mind when i was thinking about that al thanks very much for the call he was going to get it fixed this winter but he made more money plowing snow this year he just got a ton of except for all the stuff he knocked over (laughs) had to put up a few signs and parking lots other than that i got a lot done yeah we're going to take a break when we come back we want to hear from you the phone number 866-594-4150 the under the hood show is brought to you by sturdivant's Schedule your next radio appointment with the Motor Medics. Welcome back to the Under the Hood Show, 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. If you subscribe to the YouTube page and join the Hoodie Fan Club at UnderTheHoodShow.com, you could win a hoodie. Like Pat Miller, who listens to us in Owensboro, Kentucky. Congratulations from all of us here and our friends over at Universal Technical Institute, UTI. Dot edu. 
Get trained to be a motorcycle mechanic, an auto mechanic, collision repair specialist, marine mechanic specialist. To working on them outboards and inboards. Mm-hmm. Seems like inboards you always have to be working on stuff. No. Yeah, no, it seems, no. seems like it to me. Boats are cool. Unless they're old and crappy, then they're just <laughs> old is. and crappy. But the new stuff is, you know, uh, 10 years old or less. It's you may have touched on my experience. Would a, would a marine motorcycle mechanic be able to work on one of your wet bikes? Oh, no. Or do that, they don't do them together. No, it's a whole different thing. Class. But funny you should say that because <laughs> I registered those Did yesterday. You? So I look back and I said, hey, I didn't have, they call it in South Dakota, they call it a plate. It's the sticker and then it has that little decal like you have on all cars yep. around the country right in the middle. Like my snowmobile, same thing. Yeah, there you go. Well, I didn't have a plate, so I had to get, they said, well, it says you have plates. I said, well, you're right. I did get plates for these. I never put them on because we didn't use them the last time I registered them and now I've lost them. So I had to apply again. It was $4 for a couple of them. So I said, when, it's because you threw it? out everything in your house when you yeah. cleaned it. So my, my boats, <laughs> these jet skis, said 2009 on the decal that was on it. And I said, w- look at the registration history. And they said, well, you registered it in 2007, and then you didn't register either anything in 08, and then you registered them in 09. I said, you know what I did? The last time we used them was 07, which is a long time. Was ago. that when you took them down to the river? No. Oh, I, you I mean, after that? That was like 01. Oh, I, what that year was that? That was before 9-11, I think. I don't know when that was, but it was... I think it was 2000 with Paul yeah. and all those guys. Yeah. So anyways, it was a company camping trip. It was crazy. She's still mad about that. <laughs> oh, she'll be fine. <laughs> anyways, uh, I banged on the camper. They had a brand new baby, and I was like, wake up! Okay, anyways, but yeah, I registered them. I couldn't believe it had been that long. So I had read... 07 was the last time I ran that wet bike, and and here we are, and I said, I'm... I don't know. I'm going to get them out and run them and either sell them or enjoy them. But oh, yeah, sell them how do you forget? Them. How do you forget? To, I mean, how do you lose? You got to enjoy life, folks. How do you just stop and go? I'm just going to let that sit for 11, 12, 13 years. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Alan. You're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you, Alan? Um, I have a 2002 Pontiac Grand Prix, and it's... Uh, developed kind of a problem where going down the highway just briefly it it jerks and then picks right back up i think maybe it's cutting out but i can't re- even rule out the transmission doing something weird and i'm really at a loss as how to even troubleshoot with that because it's just so brief and um that's it <laughs> and then it uh, runs normally for the rest of the time it just and, and this car is something you've had for quite a while, never done this before, just started, or has it been doing it for a bit? And you just right. A I've, to you. I've had it since 07. Um, it did not do that until just recently. Um, got about 135,000 miles on it. and I realize it's old, but I still thought it was pretty reliable up until this. But it's kind of a concern because I'm assuming at some point whatever's doing that is going to break and not not keep running again. <laughs> Does it do it just so, one time and then that's it? Or does it yep. do it a couple times, two, three times? No, just one time and and uh, mm. then it might do it again. But yeah, recently I was on a trip that took it about 140 miles. I did it, I think, two times on that whole drive. So that's not be real common. Yeah. Nearly impossible to find. But if it's what I think it is, it's going to get worse. And then you can fix it. It shouldn't leave you stranded as long as you meet it somewhere in the middle between horrible and, you know, just not working. So, um, or working like it is now with just little, it sounds like an ignition miss, secondary ignition miss where you've got spark plug wires arcing through to ground or a cracked spark plug. If you take it up a hill at about 45 miles an hour, so it gets into the fully warmed up, it's in the overdrive gear, you're going up a pretty decent grade, but it's not kicked down. It has to be in overdrive and locked transmission locked up. So it's at the lowest RPM possible for 45 miles an hour. You get going up that grade and you want to accelerate just enough to where it's just before it kicks down a gear or drops out a lockup. And if you can get it to duplicate that situation on a good warm day, it's usually an ignition miss. And that can be repaired with spark plugs and wires. It's a basic tune-up thing. You might even just try a tune-up if you don't know how long it's been since it's been tuned up, plugs and wires, it's, you know, on a fuel filter, it sounds like it's 
you know, it's probably time to, and that might take care of your problem. If it is an ignition mist, that should take care of your issue. The other things that can, they can be coils, ignition modules, usually just one little mist like that. It's, it's usually more in the tune of, along those lines. Does that help you out there, Alan? Okay. Yeah. Um, I know it's been a while, well, probably really long time since any plug wires were done. Um, so I might try that and I suppose I could try, I, I do have a, another used uh, coil pack and then yes module i could just i suppose swap that whole thing swap. on there but it, it ha- happens so seldom it's hard to know if it's fixed too yeah and a lot of people will have if they've got a grand prix they might have a buick la saber or park avenue if you've got two of the same model cars you can i've seen people grab the coils the plugs uh the, the are the plug wires and the coils just swap everything over to the other car they switch them and see if the problem moves follows Alan, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Wayne. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Wayne, what can we do for you? Hey, yeah, I've got a uh, 92 Chevy Blazer with a rear window defroster. I was surprised to find that the struts are used as part of the wiring harness for that thing. And uh, the wires that come from the body to the struts are missing the end where they plug onto the male stud there. Is that something that just normally breaks right there, or has this been disconnected for some reason? Most likely it just broke. Um, they just, you know, you're talking about a vehicle that's getting pretty pretty good trips on the calendar there. 30 years. Yeah, so, I mean, over time where those ends are crimped on, they will break off, and you have sometimes just have to splice on another end on there. Wasn't common for them to have problems with that system. With the heated back windows, there'd probably be more problems with wiring underneath the foot area on the driver's side or along the side where water would get in or moisture off of boots and different things in the wintertime will eventually can corrode some wires up further in the vehicle. But once they get back there and they're up in that higher area, it's, it's going to be age that kills that plug-in. Or if someone has serviced those struts and replaced them and they didn't quite have a little pick or a, a, the right squeezing method to get that plug in off and they end up pulling on it and then they just break it a, a lot of oh, times. Okay. You ever have those little metal plug-ins and you just can't get them apart? Oh yeah. If you just knew the right place to just push and I never know the right place to push. On or the you just under- aren't getting it pushed the right way. Uh, Russ, are you an expert on those kind of things? Well, you know what I'm talking about where they got the little, yeah. When I went to BMW school, we spent the first day, the whole eight hour day. They gave us, Boxes of connectors, <laughs> BMW connectors, and they said, here's what we're doing. We're taking these apart. We're putting them back together all day long. And there were every connector I ever used. I could use that training. Mm-hmm. Every connector ever used in any BMW any year was there, and you had to be proficient at it. Because what happens when you work on these cars? They don't sell the connectors on the BMWs. So if you break them, they're just broken. And that's a huge problem in drivability. So they want you to know how they come apart. And the European connectors can be a pain. So, but once you know, it's like, oh, I, yeah. I'm not an expert, but with many connectors, it's like learning to program the clock on a, let's pick something newer than a VCR, because a lot of our listeners <laughs> go, what's your a car? VCR? You're electronically tuned radio in a car. Yeah. Anything that you got to set a clock on, yeah. you're like, who? Huh? They're all similar. There's like a set button, a mode button, or mm-hmm. something. There's So these connectors, they're all either push down, lift up, move a lever, all these different things, and you've got to, yeah. Now imagine you have these fat little hands that are soft as a newborn, too. <laughs> I just Replacing speakers in my son's car, was I, could, I knew the connector was there. I just couldn't push it the right way. It was awful. Wayne, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Harvey. You're on the end of the hood show. Harvey, what can we do for you? Hello. Hey, I got a... Ford F-150 uh, 2008 has the 5.4 motor in it. It's been replaced. Uh, let's see. The engine was replaced at uh, um, 127,000. I got 200 and uh, 9,000 on it now. But what my problem is now is when I'm going down the road and it start gets under a load, just uh, just under a load, just before it's going to shift down it'll chug a little bit, and uh, then it, uh, 
and then if you, as well, soon as she shifts down, she seems good again. And it, I, you know, the first time I had that horrible thing, well, I'm sure Russ will remember it, but he, they replaced the engine for me, and that's been real good. I don't believe it's a cam phaser problem, because then it was noisy at an idle and all that. But Sounds like an ignition was, problem. Yep, that's that's what's going on. You've got an ignition miss on that. You you don't want to let that go too long and cause any other damage there. But it's likely time for coils on that. All eight of them. They come with the boots. You can get a kit that comes with eight coils with the boots attached. They're a weak point in a Ford, and they've got to be replaced. They're usually two or three times over the lifetime of a of a vehicle. It's it's not unlikely to see somebody replace. The complete coil assembly with the boot on that three times in a 200,000 mile period. Oof. You know, How much are we talking? Uh, if you do it yourself, you can probably pick up the coils. You could get, uh, you could get coils, boots, a couple hundred bucks. Okay. If you have a shop do it, it's going to cost more money. And of course, those are going to be available at uh, partners of ours. They've got them. Sturdivant's Auto Parts here locally carries them as a kit. Does that help you out there, Harvey? Is there any, yeah, is there any better one or the other to buy? Good question. We have used the Excel coils and also the Motorcraft coils, both of them. It depends on what kind of price you want to spend, but they've both been pretty good. Motorcraft coils, that that original equipment is going to be a very good choice for it. Harvey, thanks very much for the call. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. Harvey, thanks for the call. Matt, you're up next on the Under the Hood Show. 866-594. Prepare to learn something. You're going Under the Hood. 866 866- Five nine four four one five zero from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Let's talk to Matt. You're on the Under the Hood Show, Matt. What can we do for you? I got an old 2003 Chevy Tahoe, and um, the instrument cluster I sent in and had the lights replaced, but it always is going through languages, and it doesn't know where to stop kind of thing and it keeps on repeating all that stuff all day long and then now i've got a uh battery rundown thing and i heard that that's sort of part of the instrument cluster thing so i was just sort of wondering what your guys's thoughts were i think you may need to it, how long is if you had it less than a year the instrument cluster um i had it rebuilt yeah it's probably been a year Okay, did you did you buy one that was rebuilt and send your old one in for a core? I sent no, I sent my old one in and they repaired it. Okay. So from place in Colorado. Depending on where you sent it to. Yeah, yeah. Depending on where it went, they may have repaired yours or they may have my guess is they may have traded it, swapped it out with one that had already been repaired, which is common practice for most of these places and you, oh, you would never know right i mean right it, unless and, and you it's had... fine but what they the reason they get your old one is so they can get the exact mileage out right and then you don't have to sign an odometer statement because they have yours to to use for programming whereas if you get a new one from a partner like dorman one of our partners uh, it's you're gonna have to sign that mileage statement so if somebody comes back a year later and says i bought this vehicle from fred and he told me it had ninety thousand on it but I, I found records on Carfax that it had 150 on it. Then they're going to get a hold of Dorman, and Dorman's going to say he signed a statement right here that said it only had 90. That's why we programmed it that, because they're sending it out to you first, and then the core goes in. So you want to verify that. What what you're having though is indicative of a problem that we've seen when they send you the wrong cluster. The software is oh, wrong. In it. Okay, just so, like mildly. Right. So if they, it would work in a, let's say, in an Escalade, but it won't work in in your Sierra or your Suburban or Tahoe. It's, Interesting. It, they're different ones, and I, I ran into that in mine because I, I, I bought a used cluster. I thought I can make this work. I'll put one in out of a different vehicle, and it wouldn't work. 
So then I tried something different, and that wouldn't work. And then finally, I tried a third one that was out of something different, but I programmed it. And then I got an extra, I got a trans temp gauge. So, hey, it worked. But I think that's what's going on is they've got a different software calibration in there than what's for your vehicle. Now, maybe they took yours and they replaced the stepper motors in there and fixed all your needles. Well, but I am kind of curious. You yep. said you sent it in just to have the lights fixed? No, the lights, and then I had a couple of the gauges. And okay. Even till today, okay. my oil pressure gauge goes to 80, 80 pounds, and uh, I don't think this thing's had 80 pounds even. I don't <laughs> <laughs> Not, that would be very, yeah. And, be very and you might have a failed sending unit, which is a lot less likely on an 03 yep. Tahoe, because, I mean, that's basically what I have, too. Yep. The gauges could be bad. I want to say that. That thing, they've come down so much. When they first came out, we were selling some remanufactured units for almost $600. Remember how expensive oh, I do. they were? It was, it was and then crazy. they dropped like a rock. And I want to say now that most auto parts stores are in the low 200 ranges, if not 190 to 199 Now, some of these products have been going through the roof lately, but that's one that is still pretty steady because they're, the demand is going down so well, quickly. And they're reusing a product versus remanufacturing mm-hmm. a product, too. Does that help you out there, Matt? Yep. So I'm thinking I'm probably go down and buy a new one. And then even now, if it's, okay, it's 2003 and I want zero miles, zero miles on it. I mean, it's like, can't do it's that. all rusted out and I paid 500 bucks for it. Yep. You, they won't I mean, allow you to do they, that. Even if I sign an odometer deal. Well, okay. sure. You could, so you could take yours, you could buy one and you could sign a statement saying that it's got, they're not going to believe zero miles, but you could say, you know, pick something, but they're going to make you sign that statement. And if they come back at you, if they just happen to be, let's say they're going through quality control and somebody's just looking at these statements because they're all going to be online electronic for them. And they're going to be looking through and going, well, that's weird. No three Tahoe with this many miles on it. And let's say it's not Dorman that's looking at it. Let's say it's a, a motor vehicle authority from that state just happens to be zipping through it for some doing an audit you know like they do tax audits at businesses sometimes well they might flag it and they might call you but i, th- I think what matt is saying is he'll say, he'll mark it as not actual but, he doesn't care and, and that's where i was just gonna go. right we, matt we, we haven't yeah. we haven't talked about maybe this. we haven't talked work. about this on the air yet but as of in many states and i don't know if it's if it, i think it's federally all the way across the board but they have extended and and brought the odometer reporting requirements from the 10-year window that it's been forever now to a 20-year window. Okay. And so if you have a vehicle that's within 20 years, you're responsible for accurate reporting of the odometer, whereas it used to be once it went past that basically that 10-year mark, it was, you know, most states would say, hey, I can't verify this. It's not actual. You know, good luck. You know, just check it out. Right. Use your, use your Carfax. Use your whatever it might happen to be. But now that has changed as dealers. We've gotten new training uh, from our South Dakota Department of Revenue, and I believe this is across the board that this new federal requirement to go 20 years. Now, why I say that? Yes, he's gonna if he if if they would do it for him, he's gonna have to mark that thing as not actual. Uh, you know, this is not the actual miles. But if you wanted to use it to track yourself that way, because you know, I know like we've got little stickers we send with when we sell a recycled original equipment odometer and we'd like people to put down here's the mileage when i took it out here's the mileage when i put it in because in some of these it's stored in the cluster and in some of them it's stored in the body control module uh, of the vehicle and it's going to come right back up to the, the mileage it was on there but once you start tampering with that stuff russ is hitting it right on the head you've got to make sure you're disclosing that or else I you're saw one you're, on, you're going to get yourself in some federal trouble yeah. i saw one on carfax the other day we have carfax shop which doesn't show collisions but it said last reported mileage which leads me to believe because it said not accurate but last reported mileage which, okay you know that's leading me to believe that they don't know what the actual mileage is now but they know the last time it was reported it was one hundred and sixty nine thousand. so and, and i'm going to just throw this out there because i think it's it's the right thing to do at our facility when we buy a vehicle we know, and we're looking at it. We're taking pictures, videos mm-hmm. of the vehicle we're dismantling to show you know, what things are coming out of it if we're selling an engine or if we're selling a whatever it might happen to be. There are a lot of people out there that are brokering and reselling parts. And we found ourselves at odds with some of these brokers where we've sold them our part 
And these are the folks, some of them, some of them, that are the first ones that come up on a Google paid ad. They used to be the ones that would have some phone numbers put in yellow pages all across the country. And they were broker in these parts, but completely misrepresenting what they were selling. And so someone would call us because they'd find their way through a shipping document to say, hey, I'm having a problem, uh, you know, blah, blah, With blah. With this 30,000-mile motor you and, sold me. And we're like, okay, that was 120,000 mm -hmm. miles on that, and we know exactly what we sold. So if you're ever buying from someone, get the VIN number of the source vehicle that the part is coming from, and if you can go to one of the services uh, and do a odometer search, it's easy nowadays to find out miles on stuff mm -hmm. might cost you a couple bucks but i guarantee it might be worth it too matt thanks very much for the call 866-594-4150 let's talk to dave you're on the end of the hood show dave what can we do for you well good morning uh this is dave uh ptla you know who it is don't you anyway uh i've got a 2001 mdx acura and I'm going to take off for Wichita this afternoon. And I was, you know, fiddling around getting ready to go. And I checked the door panel, and it says that the tire pressure should be at 60 PSI. But, of course, the tires say 44 PSI. I wonder, Where should I put it? I wonder if you looked at the the spare. Maybe. I've never or seen the, 60 Or the that. KP. Um, Kilopascals. Yeah. Yeah. Run, yeah. <laughs> the other one. Thank you, Russ. Yeah. Kilometers uh, per hour. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just put air in an Acura the other day, and I want to say it was 35 pounds. So, d yeah, double check that. Go back and look at that sticker. And we're talking about the sticker on the door jam. Dave went right to it. Which is he, where you should go. Yeah, and yep. yeah, as, exactly. And look at that, and they'll typically, like, I, I bring up this old Range Rover I've been working on, but it's got different tire pressure settings from the front tires to the back tires on that particular vehicle. And spare. And the spare has a different setting. So there's three different air pressure settings on that tag. And if you look quick, you could look at the wrong one. So maybe go back and look at that again, Dave. And that just does not sound no. that it would be no, 60. It's, it's not going to be 60. There's it's just a quick disclaimer for all the people that are going to email me now and say, well, what if it's an old Explorer? It's like those were updated. And if, you, <laughs> if you're still driving an Explorer from that age, Trade it in. <laughs> Dave, thanks very much for the call. PTLA. That'll do it for another hour of the Under the Hood Show. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you on YouTube at underthehoodshow.com, and we'll see you right here next time on the Under the Hood Show. All right, that'll do it. Uh, if you're watching us live, by the way, uh, thank you for doing that. We would love if you would share this with friends, if you would tell someone about it, share subscribe. the YouTube, subscribe, cool. uh, share it on Facebook and on YouTube. Now we know we're, we'll go through and hopefully take out those gaps oh, in the, yeah. So the, when we first put a live show up, if you watch it within the first couple hours, you're going to see our commercial breaks that you, you can fast forward through them. Now they're, they'll look like this. That's what they look yeah, like. Yeah, they're horrible. But uh, if you watch horrible. it like later in the afternoon or the next day, those are going to go. So, hey, you know what? You don't you don't have to say, oh, I don't like those because they they go away. But YouTube takes a while to process. Yeah. So as soon Once as we're we, done cutting yeah. this on Thursdays at 11 a.m., it takes anywhere from two to seven hours for that thing to process so we can. And then we can go in and edit out those breaks, yeah. and then it has to do that again. So And we yeah. don't always, we can't always get to them right away. So just. If you're watching and you don't like the commercial breaks, they won't be there at some point, and we, there's not much we can do about it. We're working on uh, some it's things live. put in the gaps there. Yeah, we're gonna start. We're gonna start making some cool videos. And I got a unicycle that I've been. I have a routine that I've been working on. I figure I could do it. Laugh right, yoga. We could right. have some goat, <laughs> goat yoga. yoga. I, I could do goat yoga on the desk. Right Let's here. get some goats in here. I think that's a great that's idea. A horrible idea. <laughs> Thanks for watching the end of the hood show. Until next time, we uh, thank you for tuning in and subscribe and do all the stuff. Thanks a lot.